ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله حياه طيبه حياه سعيده a beautiful life a good life it's something every intelligent one is seeking searching looking for but if we were to ask the people those same people what is the way what is the solution we would get many different answers allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions in the quran من عمل صالحة من ذكر أو أنثى وهو مؤمن فلنحيينه حياة طيبة ولنجزينهم أجرهم بأحسن ما كانوا يعملون Allah تبارك وتعالى he mentions whoever comes with righteous actions whether he's a male or a female وهو مؤمن and he believes and he has iman فلنحيينه حياة طيبة Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions whoever comes with righteous actions and he comes with iman that Allah jalla wa'ala is going to give him a good life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give him a good abode, a good abode in the next for that which he used to do. The beautiful thing about the statement of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who lives a good life. And he has a good life here. He will also have a good life in the next. Honor upon that with you. whoever tastes it here will taste it in the next. So it all begins here in this dunya. It all begins here in this dunya. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah he mentions in the dunya jannah. That in this life there is a jannah. Whoever does not enter it and they enter the Jannah in this life, then he will not enter the Jannah in the next life. And if there's a Jannah in this world, whoever doesn't enter it, doesn't taste it, will not enter the next. Showing that it starts here in this life. And the one, it starts with a good life and ends with a good life. It starts with a good life and ends with a good life. This only necessitates, the fact that it starts and it begins with good, it necessitates that which is in between is also going to be good. As Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, He mentions, الَّذِينَ يَتَوَفَّاهُمُ طَيِّبِينَ يَقُولُونَ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ When the angels, they come and they take their souls, طَيِّبِينَ they're in a good state. يَقُولُونَ السَّلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ And it will be said to them, سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ Imagine that just for having a good life, he is going to be having a good death. يعني a righteous death. And whoever dies a righteous death, then he is going to be resurrected in a righteous way. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, وَقَالَ لَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ طِبَتٌ فَدَخُلُوهَا خَالِدِينَ When it be said to them, people who fear Allah tabarak wa ta'ala and they're gathering about to enter al-jannah it's going to be said to them peace be upon you tibitum and you be, you appear for the khuluha khalid and enter al-jannah khalid forever why because you were pure pure from shirk pure from innovation pure from sin you had a good life and Allah Jalla wa Ali mentions, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ جَنَّاتِ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَمَا سَاكِنْ طَيِّبَةً And Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala promised that the believing men, and likewise the believing women, they're going to be entered into Al-Jannah, where they will reside there forever in beautiful, good homes. Again, good life, good death, good resurrection, and a good abode. As Allah Taala he mentions. So the result 
of having a good life. It begins with good. The result of having a good life, it ends good. And likewise, the opposite. The same concept for the one who doesn't have a good life in this life. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ وَنَحْشُرُ يوم القيامة أعمى. The one who turns away from Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, from his signs, his remembrance, his way of life that Allah Jalla wa Ala wants him to be living. In reality, that life that he's going to be living is Ma'isha Tambanka, is a stressful life. A stressful life. And not only that, وَنَحْشُرُهُمْ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala is going to resurrect him blind. What do we notice here? It starts bad for him here in this world and it will end bad for him in the next. Imagine being resurrected blind. What an evil outcome. As we see, the same concept applies here. It starts bad, so it's going to end bad. And that which necessitate, necessitates that, it being good in the beginning and ending, uh, it being bad in the beginning and ending bad, that which is going to come in between is going to be bad likewise, as we see the angels. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, That when they are taking the souls out, they are beating their faces and their backs to get the soul out of the body because it doesn't want to leave, because it sees the punishment that it is going to. That is the state for the individual who did not have a good life. And a lot of us, a lot of us, we think that having wealth worldly possessions in this life is true happiness it's true happiness look at the example of qarun allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions inna qarun kana min qawmi musa fa bagha alayhim wa atainahu min min al kunuz and qarun he was from the people of musa he was from the people of musa and he transgressed transgressed against them transgressed against allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa atainahu min and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him treasure. Ma inna mafatiha latanu'u bil usbah ulul quwa. That Fir'aun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave him treasures to the point that the keys to these treasures, inna mafatiha, that his keys, it required a group of men. To carry it And even though they were carrying it They still had trouble These group of men who were strong They carried it with Except with difficulty They carried it with difficulty Imagine that That was the positions of Qarun That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him to the point where he had keys That required a group of men to carry it Strong men And even though they were strong, they still had difficulty in carrying these keys to his possessions, his treasures. But look what the outcome. He lived a bad life. He turned away from Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala made the earth swallow him up and likewise his possessions. And there was not a single individual who was able to help him. Look at that. He had and lived a bad life of arrogance and turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look what was the outcome in, this, in terms of his death. He had a bad death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him and his possessions be swallowed up. And what do you think is resurrection? And where do you think his abode is going to be? So my dear respected brothers and sisters, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned, there are two things that are required to have a good life. مِنْ عَمِنَ الصَّالِحَةً مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ An individual has to have iman and righteous Actions. Who will let the Arsala who will let the Arsala Rasula who will Huda within Al Haq? 
it is Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala who sent his messenger down. He sent his messenger. With what? Al-ilm al-nafi' wa al-amal al-salih. Al-ilm al-nafi' beneficial knowledge. That which is going to aid you in your iman. Wa al-amal al-salih. And iman and righteous actions. And have, yani having iman in Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, the creator, the sustainer, the provider, owner of all things, does what he pleases and judges with that which he wants. Our Lord, glory be to him above all imperfections. This is our Lord. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned, pay attention. لو اجتمعت الانس والجن على أن يضروك بشيء لم يضروك إلا بشيء قد كتبه الله كتبه الله عليك. If the mankind, all of mankind, and likewise the jinn were to gather, they were to gather to harm you in a way, they will never be able to harm you except that which Allah تبارك وتعالى already ordained for you. And likewise, the opposite. لو اجتمعت الانس والجن على أن ينفعوك بشيء لم ينفعوك إلا بشيء قد كتبه الله لك. That if they gathered the mankind and the jinn, they gathered to what? To benefit you in a way. They will never be able to do so except that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already ordained for you. And Allah Jalla wa'ala, He's Arhamur Rahim, the most merciful one that shows mercy, even more than your mothers. Even more than your mothers. This is who we have Iman in. And the effects of Iman, the effects of Iman. The effects of Iman, we'll see this in the hadith of Ibn Abbas عنه, on the authority of Abu Sufyan. For Abu Sufyan, he said, I went. I went out during the period of truce between me and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Once I was in Syria, the letter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was handed over to uh, Caesar, yani the Emperor of Rome. The letter was brought by yani, Dihyatul Kalbi who delivered it to the governor of Busra. The governor passed it to the emperor of Rome. And he, he said, is there anyone from the people of this man who, think, who thinks that he is a prophet? Yani, Nabiullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was trying to call a group of his people, yani the Quraysh. So people said, yes. So I was called, yani Abu Sufyan, along with others from the Quraysh. We were admitted to the Caesar of uh, the, to the to the emperor of Rome, and he seated up, uh, he seated us before him. They were all sitting in front of the emperor. He asked, "Which of you has closer kinship to the man who thinks that he is a prophet?" Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Abu Sufyan. He said, "I." So they seated me in front of him, and stated my companions behind me. So Abu Sufyan was in front, and his companions were behind him. Then he called his interpreter. Interpreter. And said to him, tell them that I am going to ask this fellow, yani Abu Sufyan, about the man who thinks that he is a Prophet If he tells a lie, then refute him. And they had these companions behind Abu Sufyan. Why? That way, if he tells a lie, his companions will do ishara. They will point and allude to that he is, he is lying. He is lying. So Abu Sufyan told the narrator, by Allah, and his companions, they, they, they don't want khair for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So even if he were to lie, they most likely would have not called him out for it. So he had the opportunity to lie, even though he was behind him. Yeah, they were behind him. But what did Abu Sufyan say? By Allah, if there was not the fear that falsehood would be imputed to me, I would have lied. And this was the characteristics of the Arabs. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned, إِنَّمَا بُعُثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ صَالِحَ الْأَخْلَاقِ أو مكارم الأخلاق. I was sent to complete good manners. And to complete something means that there's already a base that is present. And that is what we find with the Arabs. That they hated lying. And it was, it was a bad character, characteristic to, to be يعني, associated with. So the emperor... He, he said to his interpreter, inquire from him about his ancestry and his lineage. I said he is of a good lineage. Abu Sufyan is saying this ancestry 
history among us. He asked, has there been a king amongst his lineage? I said, no. He asked, do you accuse him of falsehood before he proclaimed his prophethood? I said, no. He asked, who are his followers? People of high status or low status? I said, of low status. He asked, are they increasing in number or decreasing? I said, no, they are rather increasing. He asked, does anyone give up his, this religion, his religion, being dissatisfied with it? Pay attention, dissatisfied with it. After having embraced it, I said, no. He asked, have you been at war with him? I said, yes. He asked, how do you fare in that war? What was the outcomes? He said, the war between us and him has been wavering like a bucket. And we win some and we lose some. Sometimes he suffered a loss at our hands and sometimes we suffered a loss at his hand. He asked, has, there, has he ever violated his covenant? I said, no. But we have recently concluded a peace treaty with him for a period and we did not know what he is going to do about it. And that was the only bad thing Abu Sufyan could say. It wasn't even bad within of itself, but that was the only bad thing that he could utter. Like, we don't know what he's going to do with it. He asked, did anyone make the proclamation of prophethood before? For him, and amongst the people, Abu Sufyan said no. So the interpreter told. So he, he now said to the interpreter, "Tell him." And he told Abu Sufyan, "I asked him about his lineage, and he had replied that he had the best lineage." And he, the Prophet sallallahu This is the case with the prophets. This is the emperor. He's saying this. They are the descendants of the noblest amongst their people. He continued. The emperor continued. I asked you. If there had been a king amongst his lineage, you said that there has been none. If there had been a king amongst his lineage, I would have said that he was a man demanding his ancestral kingdom. I asked you about his followers, whether they were people of high or low status, and you said they were of, and they were of rather low status. They were of uh, low status. They were of low status. Such are the followers of the prophets. I ask you whether you used to accuse him of falsehood before, pro, before his proclaiming of prophethood. And you said that you did not. So I have understood that when he did not allow him to tell a lie about the people, he would never go to the length. And he, so he's saying this about the Prophet So I have understood that when he did not allow himself to tell a lie about the people, he would never go to the length of forging a falsehood about Allah. And if this individual was a sadiq, a mean, in terms of the people, then what is the case with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why would he forge a falsehood about Allah? I asked you whether anyone renounced his religion being dissatisfied with it after he had embraced it. And you replied in the negative. And this is the shahid that I want from this hadith. That you replied in the negative. And no one leaves it after they have embraced it. Faith, this is what the Emperor of Rome said, faith is like this when it enters the depth of the heart. That is the result of having Iman. Imagine the companions were in situations where they left everything. They left everything coming from a wealthy home and leaving it all for Islam and not regretting it, nor wanting to leave it. Why? Because how they feel, the lifestyle that they are living. It is a happy life. As some, uh, there's some narrations where they mention that there was two individuals, they wanted to eat bread, but the bread was too, it was too tough to chew it off, to chew it directly. So they went to the sea to dip the bread in the sea, just so they could soften the bread so they can eat it. And they told one another that if the kings, they knew the happiness that we had in our heart, the iman that resides in their heart, they said they would fight us for it. Even though they what? They had no worldly possessions. And if we look at a great companion, Musa'ab, he was a man that when he would come to a gathering, they would be able to smell him from afar. He was a wealthy young man, but he gave everything for the sake of Allah to the point a companion who wants to go make hijrah. Make hijrah to the Prophet ﷺ, he was caught by the Quraysh. And he said, if I were to give you everything in my possession, would you let me go? I just want to go to the Prophet ﷺ to Al-Medina. They took all of his possessions and he went. Look at 
that. That is the state. That is the life, the feeling that they have when iman and righteous actions are accompanied with one another. And the second thing we mentioned from iman being the first is righteous actions. One needs to come with this. The example of doing hajj. The reward of it, if it is accepted by Allah, you will be like a newborn baby. Salah to salah. Salah is very important. As some of the scholars, they were staunch. And the likes of Ibn Uthaymi, he said, La shak, it has no doubt that the one who leaves off the salah, even if he believes that is wajib, even if he just leaves it off, he's a kafir. That's how staunch that some of the scholars were with it when it comes to the salah. And this is from Amr al-Salih. And the one from salah to salah, it's a means for your sins to be forgiven. Jum'ah to Jum'ah. Umrah to Umrah. Ramadan to Ramadan. All of these good actions that a Muslim, he comes with. And these good deeds, my dear respected brothers and sisters, it has an effect on the soul. Actions that are in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase our iman. And sins that we engage in in obedience of the shaitan, it will decrease our iman as we believe that Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And righteous actions not only have an effect on the iman, but it has an effect on the body, on the body. As we see that dhikr has an effect in terms of uwa, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran. And we see Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, Ibn al Qayyim, he used to see Ibn Taymiyyah, he used to sit after Fajr for a long period of time doing dhikr. And Ibn Taymiyyah, when, when Ibn Qayyim, he asked Ibn Taymiyyah, why is that the case? He mentioned that this is the food for the body. And he dhikr actually gives you strength. So doing righteous actions, it has an effect on the body. The soul, the body, and the way an individual feels is intellect. But without the first thing being iman, there is no benefit in that which you are doing. مَنْ كَانِ يُرِيدُ حَرْثَ الْآخِرَةِ نَزِدَ لَهُ فِي حَرْثِ وَمَنْ كَانِ يُرِيدُ حَرْثَ الدُّنْيَا نُؤْتِهِ مِنْهَا وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ نَصِيبِ And the one who wants the akhirah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give it and multiply it for him. And the one who just wants this worldly life, Allah is going to give him only that which he desires and he will have no portion of the hereafter. So my dear respected brothers and sisters, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants you the opportunity, he blesses you, gives you the favor of having iman in your heart and guides you to righteous actions, then there is nothing that is going to harm you in that which has missed you in this life. And likewise, the opposite, if one was to gain a lot of wealth and misses out in terms of iman and righteous actions, then in the end, none of that will benefit him. Even we see in the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ, he mentions, man la yashba'an, that two individuals, they do not become full and they will, ever be, they will forever be hungry. Talibu al-ilm wa talibu al dunya the one who seeks knowledge and the one who seeks this dunya and the one who's given a valley of gold the child of adam when he's given a valley of gold he's only going to want to wahakada that is the case of the one who seeks this worldly life to the point that he chases this world and forgets himself so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forget him in conclusion my dear respected Brothers and sisters, a happy life is an Islamic life. Whoever comes with righteous actions, whether he's a male or a female, and he has iman, then Allah Taala will give him a good life. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu la.